Good morning, Antioch Nation. Good morning, Antioch Nation. It is a blessing to be amongst all of you. We're going to go ahead and get started with our praise and worship on this morning. So we ask that you open your minds, open your hearts, so that we can uplift our hands to Jesus on this morning.
Warriors on God. We come this morning with our heads and all our hearts. Just as they come. Thank you. Realizing how good and how kind you've been to us. Father, you've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. Took care of from the early days. I pray up until this present time. We come this morning to Heavenly Father realizing that it's not our goodness that calls us to be here. But it's just a twist of thine coming yeah, yeah. Sprinkle in our lives and they grab hold of the moments of the Lord a little while. And we'll say it. Thank you. Father, we're praying this morning night and that you just don't leave us alone. Throw your loving arms and protect us around. Bind us so close together, one can't follow without us. Father, we come this morning because we need you. We need you in a special manner. We need you in our homes. We need you on our jobs. And we need you right here in the church. Father, have mercy on us. Father, we come this morning asking. And as we go through the tough times in life, See, right now, we are wrapped up in this COVID-19. The scientists, the doctors are looking for a vaccination. But I come this morning, and y'all can tell you the vaccination is already here. It's here in Jesus. All you got to do, man, y'all can just hold on to the hand. And the vaccination is already here. See, see we're not doing the things that we're supposed to do. But when we as a nation come together and realize who he is and start to do the things we should do, you'll be surprised about this vaccination that we're looking for. Father, we come this morning to pray my parents that you planted here. I ask that you continue to crown his head with more wisdom and knowledge from on high. Let it down and put the strength of the dying holy word to help his father to come up here and have a word with these. Father, we're praying and asking that you just don't leave us alone. Father, out of all of the things that's happening to us and all around us, we know that this is all in your hands. And we are praying this morning to the Father that you just don't leave us alone. Then, the Heavenly Father, we're praying for a little more mercy and a little more grace. As I climb up the rough side of the mountain, I know every once in a while I'm going to slip and fall. But this God that I serve can just pick me up. Just be always starting me on my way. Father, as I climb on up the roof side of the mouth, I'm praying for a, a mind that every once in a while I can sit down and look back. Yeah. See just how far you grow. Then the Heavenly Father allow me to lift my eyes and put the heels from which come at my head. Realize that it comes from me to be alone. For Father, you're good and you're kind and we just want to say thank you. Thank you for just being God all by right yourself. Yeah. But Father, one of these old days, you won't be alone. I'm to look for me and I'll already be gone. But any of y'all got to come praying and saying, don't worry about me. I'm just another one of God's shoes. Passing through. Father, we are saying, now, when I go into life, my way, your time to call and I must ask. You're praying for a home and that kingdom where I can praise your name. In your son Jesus' name, I pray for his sake. Amen. Amen.
least another week before the official end of summer. We will continue our studies, our sermon series, and some of songs. Songs of 138 number. When your world is cold and your friends are few, there's someone, someone. for me. Your steadfast 
Love, O oh Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. If I can lift from the A clause our sermonic theme, our thrust on today, I'd simply like to title this sermonic exercise Walking in the Midst of Trouble. Here in this song, it's simply ascribed as a song of David, no particular reason, though we have discovered after having spent summer in the Psalms that not all the Psalms were written by David, but whenever David wrote a song, he was not writing a song because of what he possessed in his head, but rather he was writing a song because of what he knew in his heart. And in his heart, he knew that God was a defender. He knew that God was a deliverer. He knew that God was and is worthy of all of our adoration. There are several suggestions that uh, we could uncover, we could um, embrace as to why David writes Psalms 138, but we will not uh, spend any amount of time on suggesting as to why David writes the psalm. All we know is that there are several instances that would give credibility uh, as to why David wants us to know that even though he walks through the midst of trouble, God is a preserver. I would, child of God, that before we begin to delve into the context of the text, particularly the context centering around verses 7 and 8, that we'll back up a little bit and we will embrace that we will engage in how the psalmist begins this psalm. The psalm is a psalm of thanksgiving. There are several types of psalms. There are psalms of praise. These psalms are not psalms that are asking God for anything. They are just psalms that are thanking God for who he is. And if you have lived in a measurable amount of time, you've learned how to thank God for who he is. Not only are there psalms of praise, psalms of praise that normally end with a doxology encouraging others to praise the Lord, but there are also psalms of lament, psalms of sorrow. These are psalms that are saying to God from the soul because the individual is going through a particular tough time in life. And I'm sure that all of us in here have gone through some tough times in life. Tough times in life that you realize that the only person you can talk to is God himself because he is seemingly the only one who understands or even cares exactly how you feel. There are imprecatory songs. These are songs where you want God to get somebody. You realize that the enemy is bigger and stronger than you. You realize that the problem is over your head, and so you are asking God to come and see about you, and come and see about you now, and you are asking God to handle your enemies. That's a good place for a child of God to do, because God has never wanted or desired us to handle our enemies ourselves. God has always wanted us to place our enemies in his hand, because God has a great track record of fighting your enemies. I'm looking at some folk right now that you know for yourself that there were some inst instances and individuals that were over your head, but you placed those instances and individuals in the hands of God and you discovered that God will fight your battles just to make sure that I'm in the midst of some church folk. I need to see all the hands of those who know that God will fight your battles, whether you're sitting in the living room or here at the annex, I need to see the hands one more in of all of those who know that God will fight. He'll fight your battles. And here, this is a song of thanksgiving. It's 
thanking God for what God has done. And I just need to remind everybody that where you are, God brought you. For that, you ought to give him thanks. What you know, God taught you. And for that, you ought to give him thanks. What you possess, God gave you. And for that, you ought to give him thanks. And so the psalmist here is giving God thanks for something that God has done. And this, this psalm is an individual psalm. It's not a psalm that is communal. It's not a psalm that is governmental. He is not inviting others in a communal way. It's not governmental. He's not praying for a leader or praying himself. It's individual. He's thanking God for what God has done for him. And is there anybody in here today, anybody watching me on today that can thank God for what God has done for you individually? Anybody here today want to give God some praise because you know for yourself that God has been good to you? Nobody has to ask you to give your name a high five. Nobody has to ask you to jump up and down and tell them thank you. Nobody has to encourage the praise patrol to come and sit next to you and ask you to engage in physical celebration of Thanksgiving. But when you think, you automatically think. And can somebody here just stop for about seven seconds and just think about what God has done and then therefore engage in thanking him for all the great things he's done for you. You, so it is. Psalmist is thinking. Thank you, Lord. And automatically he is thanking God. Your praise ought not be a praise that is unintelligent. Praise is intelligent. Praise is the response to thinking of all the wonderful things that God has and yeah, is yeah, yeah. doing in the life of a believer. He says, I'm going to give you praise and thank you. And I'm not just going to do it partially. I'm going to do it with my whole heart. I won't just do it with my whole heart. But you've got some people who think that they are God. They think that they are worthy of being adored. And so God, for all these people who want to act as if they are bigger than you because of a title that they hold, all these people who want to think that they are bigger than you because they can text or tweet, and then all of a sudden civil unrest is disrupted and erupts just because individuals wear badges and individuals hold offices, they think that they are gods. No, they are not gods. And to let them know that they are not gods, here is what I'm going to do as a believer in you. I'm going to praise you here in front of me. I like this. Because all too often, we as the people in our culture want to alter our cultural, spiritual behavior in front of certain folk. You, you, you know how we are. As soon as God gives us a degree or a dime above a dollar, we begin to think that we are too sophisticated to praise the Lord. Nobody can be too praising God. When you live in the projects with roaches running everywhere, nobody can beat you praising God. When you have to survive off of rice and boiled chicken, nobody can beat you praising God when all you had was some grits. And nobody can beat you praising God when you were down and out. But just as soon as God delivered you from spam to hell, you begin to act as if you were better than somebody yeah. else. And you can no longer praise him with and in front of the folk that you used to praise him with and in front of. We see you with your nice new car, your new clothes that did not come from the Salvation Army or Goodwill. We see you no longer have to wear hand-me-down, but you ought to praise God more yeah. on this side of life than you did on the other side of life. Why? Because God has been good to you and he didn't have to do it. But he did. That does not matter who was in the crowd. Does not matter 
who was watching, I'm still going to praise God. I'm still going to give thanks to God. I'm still going to preach and sing to God because I know that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I know where I would be. I'm going to praise you in front of the gods. I'm going to bow down toward the symbol of your presence here. The psalmist says, I bow down towards your holy temple because in the holy temple, behind the holy of holies was resting that visible manifestation of the presence of God, that sacred Hebrew carrying case known as the Ark of the Covenant. And so the psalmist says, I'm going to bow down towards your presence. I'm glad today that this morning when I bowed down, didn't have to bow down toward Antioch. Did not have to bow down toward any other particular religious structure. Right. Right. I could just bow down and wherever I am, whatever direction I bow down in, God is on my presence. So the psalmist says, I'm going to bow down towards your presence. When was the last time, if you were able, that you took the time to bow down? When was the last time that you felt it necessary to bow down? He says, and I'm going to give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. His grace, his mercy is forever faithful. God, you exalt your name and your word above all things. We serve a God who is bigger than any entity or individual that we could ever imagine. You should never feel intimidated by anything earthly because you serve a God who is with God, I'm thanking you because when I called you, verse 3, That's right. you answered me. Well, Amen. Not only did you answer me, God, but when I was weak, when I was scared, you gave strength to my soul. Has life ever beat you down? Has life circumstances ever cause you to become afraid? I see you. I know that you want everybody to think that you are big and bad and nothing and nobody moves you and shakes you. But every now and then life creates fear. Even in those of us who have reputations never being scared. Some have said, Lord, I've been scared. But when I was discouraged, you gave my soul strength. Because of what I do, my praise, my thanksgiving, my adoration of you because of who you are. Psalm says, all the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, because they have heard the words of your mouth. Well, how does people, how do people rather hear the words of God's mouth. They hear the words of God's mouth through God's heralders, those who don't mind testifying yeah, yeah, yeah. of the goodness of God. All too often we have people who want to remain silent. Nobody wants to share the good news of God anymore. Everybody wants to keep their relationship with the Almighty a private matter. But when you know the Lord, sometime, some city, somewhere, somebody needs to know how you feel about God so that they can recognize that God is moving in their life and they can tell somebody else too. All shall sing of the way 
praise the Lord. For great is the glory to God. Great is the presence, the weightiness of God. For the Lord is high. He regards the lowly. He regards the lowly. But the haughty, he knows from afar. I like this because all my life, I've realized who I am. Proud of who I am. Never been ashamed of being an African American male. Both disenfranchised, though marginalized, though I've been the victim of racism, though I've been the victim of bias, I still love mankind as mankind. I still seek the best for everyone. And the reason I do this is because there is not something but somebody that possesses me, that gives me the capacity to do for right, even when they do me wrong. And when something even greater than that, God is on the side of the lowly. Did y'all see that in your Bible? Yeah, that's right. Here you are bemoaning the color of your skin. Here you are bemoaning the fact that you are considered a minority. Here you are bemoaning the fact that you are not rich. You don't have a degree. You don't live in a certain zip code. Here you are bemoaning that social indicators regard you as being lowly. But that's not a bad place to be because the Bible declares that God regards the lowly. You can walk around here all you want to. You know something about Soon as God blesses them, they stick their chest out, throw their shoulders back, hold their heads up in the air in arrogance and conceit as if they are better than somebody. You better be careful, child of God. Because when you begin to think that you are all of that, when you begin to think that you are just so sedated, you just might find yourself not being regarded by God. Therefore, I stay humble because I know that humbleness is the way and I know that as long as I remain under the almighty hand of God, that God is in the exalted business. But here's, here's the bad news. Those who think they are better than someone, bigger than someone, someone who thinks that they have superiority because of wealth or because of race. Yeah. He says, but the heart. Yeah. He knows them, yes, but it's not up close and personal. Uh -huh. There is no way you can say that you have a relationship with God yeah. Yeah. when you think that you are superior to someone yeah. because yeah. of wealth because of race, because of some social standing. No, nobody is better than anybody. All of us were made in the Imago Dei, the very image of God. And so therefore, when you exalt yourself, God distance himself from you. I don't know about you, but I want to be known up close to God. Because every now and then, I got pressures and pains and problems, and I need know that God is me. Now the psalmist enters into the situation that is before us. He's walking in the midst of trouble. Trouble is when we ride down the highways now and particularly in Warren, Michigan, a man and his wife are the victims of all types of racial attacks and victims of intimidation because they had a sign on their door that said Black Lives Matter. 
Though those of you here know that I'm not a particular proponent of Black Lives Matter because, as I've said before and I'll say again, yeah. Black Lives can't matter until Black Lives Matter to Black folk. Yeah. Black lives cannot matter until young black boys stop settling conflict with pistols. Black lives can't matter until young black males realize that there's a better way of life than slinging and selling. And I know that you are not the only ones who are doing it, but I'm not talking about anybody else but you. I'm talking to my children now. You cannot do what everybody else does. And so lives can't matter until lives matter to us. Nobody will respect you until you respect yourself. Be that as it may. Intimidation because they have a sign. House shot at nine miller shell casings unleashed in their house in Warren, Michigan. You can discover this. Video camera catches the culprit, but nobody has yet identified him. Only a $3,000 reward for the individual who engaged in this intimidating act. But yet there are those who would attack us because you have a certain sign in your yard, because you have a certain mantra hanging from your home, they'll attack you. Your sign means no harm. Your sign does not suggest that you're about to engage in unrest or that you are a divisive person, but every day I see flags that symbolize Flags that symbolize intimidation. You know, I've been a voter now since I was 18 years old. Almost 30 years ago. Never in my life have I seen flags that I've seen like I see today. I, I didn't see flags celebrating both bushes. I didn't see flags celebrating Clinton. I didn't see flags celebrating in my youth really, but I've seen a lot of flags. Now flags that seemingly are bent on intimidation. And even now when I go to McDonald's in the morning to get cups of coffee, I see flags. And some of these flags even parked in front of Christian churches. It, it, it makes me wonder Am I walking in the midst of trouble? The flags are not enough to realize we are trouble. <laughs> Rhetoric from political figures makes us realize we are in the midst of trouble. If racist rhetoric is not enough to make you realize we are in the midst of trouble, when was the last time you walked down the street in a neighborhood that you grew up in that is predominantly inhabited by people who look like us. Do you feel as safe as you used to feel? Are your streets the same? Are the individuals that you grew up in and around the same peaceful individuals that you used to know? Or is everyone suspect? Now, on your job, are you constantly having to look over your shoulder because there's always somebody who is trying to throw some type of stumbling block in your way so that they can get you fired? Do you have somebody who you once considered a friend, but you discovered that they were fake friends? Anybody here have any instance, any situation or circumstance that make you realize that you're in the midst of trouble? Don't worry about it because when you're in the midst of trouble, whether it is anguish, mentally, whether it is a fixed affliction, both internally and externally, whether it is adversity, please understand one thing. God is a preserver. In other words, God is a God of mercy. Though you could succumb to affliction, adversity, and anguish, 
anguish. God won't let design destroy you. He preserves you. Look at you. Willie Collins, look at you. Kill Adams, look at you. Zondra Shipman, look at all of you. You go through some stuff. That if people only knew the pain you had to endure. They would ask you if they knew everything about you. How did you make it, Brother Daniels? You would have time in a day, a week, a lifetime to tell them how you made it through this circumstance, through that situation. All you can say is that God preserved me. That sickness, that situation, God preserve me. He preserves me. He protects me. He says, you stretch out your hands against the wrath of my enemies and your right hand delivers me. I'm almost done y'all. But my soul is happy. He says, I preserve you. People now look at you, wonder how you made it. But just because you made it does not mean that your enemies will cease to attack you because your enemies are going to attack you because they want to have the ability to say that your God cannot continuously take care of you. So they don't stop. They continuously launch their attacks. But what they don't know is that God preserves you to protect you. I don't know if sense people watch this. Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. Yeah. Other day I picked some pears. But, but let me let me be honest with y'all. I didn't pick. <laughs> they were picked for me, but again, they were brought to me. And in picking these pears, I knew that I was not going to eat all the pears of the books. And so I wanted to preserve the pears, yes, yes. to protect the pears. Because had I left them out right. on the counter, outside, yes. they would have rotted, right. withered, yes. flies, insects, yes. other entities would have destroyed the pears. So I took right. some of the pears uh -huh. to my mama. Thank God, my mama. Right. And I told mama yeah. to do what you do. Preserve them so they can be protected. And here they are going through a process of preservation to be protected. And the protection comes through placing the preserve inside of a jar and putting a cap on the jar until it's ready to be opened again. Watch this. God preserve you to protect you. God has not allowed you to come here by accident. God has not allowed you to live just so you can brag about how old you are. God has preserved you to protect you. And so here the psalmist says, my enemies trying to destroy me, but God, you push them back and you pull me up. That's what it says. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of your enemies with one hand. But with the other hand, you pull me up. Enemies all around trying to get to me, but you push my enemies back and you pull me up. I like this kind of God that pushes enemies back, pulls me up. The reason you are not dead, the reason you have not lost your mind is because God pushed some things back and he pulled you up. God, why? Did you do all of this? Why did you allow me to survive being in the midst of trouble? Yeah. I can tell you why. God has a purpose for you. Amen. Your life yeah. is not an accident. There is something that God wants you to do. If you don't know what God wants 
was the cause. You take Central and Jericho and they can be. Do you think you feel this long because you got longevity in your DNA? Do you actually think you live this long because you have not drank or smoked or didn't eat pork every day? Do you actually think that you live this long? Because you have not succumbed to diabetes, high blood pressure, COVID-19. Do you actually think that you made it this far? Because you've got Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Edna, Aflac. Do you think that you live this long? Because of your job, your degree, your zip code, you don't live in an area that is full of pollutants. Do you think you live this long? Just by happenstance and incidentally no? Lived as long because in the midst of trouble, God revived you, He preserved you, He protected you. I, I know, I know when you think of protection, you think of some enemy who's trying to rob you, trying to take your life. But, but I'm not ignorant, I, I, I'm looking at some ladies, some looking, some listening to me right now that been in relationships where he tried to break you down. He zapped your sense of self-worth. He made you feel as if you were nothing and nobody. Matter of fact, truth be told, there's some people, you don't have to raise your hand up, say to anyone, but there's some people that sometimes you have a gun in your house and you wonder, how much better it would be if you just took your life. You, you look at your medicine cabinet and you said, God, what if I just take eight of those pain pills? What if I just go ahead now, God, and just end it all? You, you, you want to just get in your car, drive, and never come back because they broke you down. Not just Women, but men also, you go through horrible circumstances in your life that you wish it was all over. You sat in your gun room, or actually looked at your gun. The devil has spoke to you and said, go ahead. You're better off dead. You even second guess yourself. You walk in the presence of other men and you have been made to feel like that other woman because she didn't respect you and treat you right. To, made to feel as if you were less than some other man. Not just physically, but financially. All, all types of things that affect us, that God preserved us from. And have you ever stopped to look back at your life those times you wanted it over, times you wanted to end it all, and here you are now on the other side of what you thought you could never get through. And you said to yourself, God, you are preserved. That jail sentence, standing in front of a judge, and you thinking that you were facing some time that you can't survive. But look at you now. Say God is a preserver. Loneliness. Nobody knows about loneliness when you're at home by yourself looking at four walls. No phone calls. You know how it is when the kids get grown, they don't want to fool with mama much anymore. Don't want to fool with daddy much anymore. Eating by yourself, watching TV alone, wishing somebody would come by. You're so startled when somebody comes by that it scares you. Don't know how to act because by yourself now. Isn't it good to know that even though you're alone, that God has kept you in your right mind? That he's, he's a preserver. Isn't it good to know that while you're alone and you're wondering, God, I, I don't know how to no pistol. I don't know how to fight nobody. I, I'm, I'm like, I'm like, see me and 
color purple. I don't know how to fight. I, right. Fight is not in me, but aren't you glad that every night you go to bed, wake up in the morning, you realize that God preserves and protects. Nobody broke through the window. Nobody kicked the door out. Not because they didn't think about it, just because of God. It's protected. And he's doing it all because regardless of how old you are, God still has a purpose for you. That's why the psalmist said, God, don't abandon me. Don't forsake the work of your hands. Now you have to dig deeper into this hands business because hands are always symbolic in the Bible of the power of God. And so the psalmist is saying, God, you are working on me in your power. Your performance is because of your power. Our presence is because of a performance of God's power. Y'all don't know him. Look, 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 back to problems. Church folk have been allowed to think far too long that you got up this morning that you were clothed in your right mind no your presence is a performance of God's power your right mind y'all see my glory but you really don't know my story I tell you service matters but until you've been homeless until you actually live outdoors not knowing where the next meal is going to come from, maybe you can't appreciate the performance of God's power. Maybe you can't understand what it's like to wear clothes that are too small for you and you have to unbutton the button. Maybe you don't understand what it is. Washing your clothes, sensitive garments, you can't fix them. In the sink, of a gas station. You don't understand what it's like brushing your teeth with a rag. And then here I am today. And you think that I'm not going to praise him All right. and celebrate him for the performance of his power for keeping me in the midst of trouble. People said I wasn't going to make it. I'm testifying now. Yeah. People said I never amount to anything. People said that I was no good, good for nothing. But I'm glad that God preserves to protect you. You, you too. That job you got, you should have. House you live in, you should live there. The mind you have, you should not possess. God preserve in order to protect. Yes, I'm concerned about the culture we're living in. I'm concerned about the boldness and the emboldening of certain individuals. I'm, I'm concerned about the events that might unfold in November if things don't go the way that certain populists want them to go. I'm concerned about the unrest that might erupt when another person of color is killed at the hands of an overzealous, intimidated, untrained officer of the law. I'm, I'm concerned about a whole lot of things, but you know what I've lived long enough to find assurance in. I've lived long enough to find assurance in Psalms 137. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. Isn't that good news? Even in the midst of our present set of circumstances, all we've been through, though we're right in the middle of it. God preserves our lives. He preserves our protecting us, pushing back our enemies, pulling 
building us up close to him and allowing us to realize we have a purpose. Maybe there's someone here on today. Don't mind the train. Invitation to extend the doors open. Someone here today who does not know the Lord, pardon of sin. Someone here today who has allowed situations to intimidate you, to discourage you. Someone here on today who feels as if you don't have purpose, but God does not have a plan for your life. Someone here today who felt that you lived this long because God was punishing you. No, no. God has a purpose for you. God has been preserving you. God has been protecting you. You should have lost your mind. As a matter of fact, you, you should have suffered from alcohol poisoning, all the stuff you drink. <laughs> Come on now. All, all, all the stuff you put in your veins, all the stuff you smoke, all the stuff you did that nobody knows about. You, you should be here. Promiscuity. All the times that you ran from him to her, from her to him. And you don't have HIV. Come on, you, you. God preserved you in order to protect you. Is there one? Is there one? The invitation is extended. Doors of my father's house are open. Let's pray. Eternal God, our Father, we say thank you now because like the psalmist, we realize we live long enough now to know that we walk in the midst of trouble. Trouble that we never thought we would get through over or around. But God, because you preserved us, because you protected us, and because you are perfecting your purpose in us, we are still here. And God, for that we say thank you. And we pray, oh God, that we will share with somebody else the great things that you have done for us, are doing for us, and that we will tell the down tribe that you are an evil God and that you are in the picking up business. And though they're disregarded, and denied by me that you are God that looks down on the humble, those who have been pushed aside, those who have been marginalized and disenfranchised. We thank you, God, for being a God who looks down on the Lord. Continue, God, to keep us. Watch over us, govern, guard, and guide us like only you can. And we'll be able to carefully give you the praise. In the matchless, marvelous, and majestic name of Jesus the Christ. And this can be great. Thank God and amen. Now may the grace of God, love of our Christ, fellowship of his spirit, rest, rule, and abide with his children now, henceforth, and for them. All of God's children in Christ's name will say amen. 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 Because carefully. If you would like a free donation of a food item, would you just uh, take a moment before you leave and uh, come forward and uh, we will uh, give you the food item. I won't tell you what it is. But I guarantee it's more than what you had. So, uh, they are bring them out now, and uh, you can put it on the grill. So, if you would like a free food item, would you come just now? Father Lisa, he's protecting you to preserve you, baby. God bless you. If you like a free food item, please, you put it on the grill, you put it in the oven, you can actually put this in a piece of fried if you like. You can bake it, you can roll it.
Thank you. 